I don't know why I'm stating the obvious, but why stop now? Our next speaker, speaker is Dr. Don Morton. Uh, Don has had a tremendous influence in shaping astronomy in Australia and astronomy in Canada. Um, he was director general of Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics during a very difficult period where he had to make some, some decisions which really led to us entering the field of 10 meter astronomy. Um, and, and balancing various concerns. And for those of you who are astrophotographers, when he was director, he's, he's second director of the Anglo-Australian Observatory, he's a guy who hired David Mallon. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> well, since um, a visit to the observatory is part of the uh, program this, this week, I thought I <clears throat> might uh, describe a little bit of what it was like working at the observatory when it was uh, functioning. Um, <clears throat> it <clears throat> started back for me in 1952. I'd just uh, uh, finished writing the, um, <clears throat> finished high school, writing the nine exams necessary for university entrance. I hadn't done anything about finding a summer job. Um, I did have a considerable interest in astronomy, read uh, read widely, had joined the society earlier that year, um, and it occurred to me, is it, is it possible that the observatory might have use for uh, uh, somebody for the summer? Um, <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> uh, living in Toronto, I drove up to, the, up to Richmond Hill, uh, knocked on the big front door of the observatory, um, <clears throat> was greeted by the secretary, Barbara Creeper. Uh, she later married uh, solar astronomer, Vic Kazoskis. Um, so I explained to Barbara my uh, wondering if a summer job might be possible. Uh, she explained that uh, all the astronomers were at the university today, and, um, but she'd take my name and phone number and pass it on to the director, Dr. Hurd. Um, she said, well, while you're here, um, uh, come in, I can at least introduce you to Dr. Chant, because he came in, <clears throat> he lived in the uh, uh, adjacent uh, uh, house on the property, came in every day and uh, worked, of course, as editor of the journal. Well, I did that show. Dr. Hurd uh, did telephone me and said, uh, why don't you come over uh, this evening and we could talk a little bit. Well, that I did. And, uh, <clears throat> but he said, well, you know, we don't normally take uh, uh, summer students who so had at least one year at the university. Oh, <laughs> but um, we're short, we're, we're short uh, this summer, so come up a day after tomorrow and we'll see what something might be possible. Um, so indeed, I went up to the observatory and thinking maybe there might be some simple tasks that I could uh, do at the observatory. And, but what was the, the first thing? Uh, Heard handed me to Jerry Longworth, the instrument, instrument taker. He took me over to the dome uh, with the purpose of showing me how to run the telescope. So, <clears throat> well, uh, in fact, there it was, the 74-inch the telescope, the fourth largest telescope in the world at that time. Uh, in fact, it was the first time I'd seen the telescope because I'd never got around to getting up to the observatory during the open nights. But of course, um, <clears throat> uh, during the day, the telescope is stowed in a ho nearly horizontal position, and the first the first steps in getting the telescope ready for observing is to uncover the mirrors. Well, you can go up around on the catwalk on the inside of the dome and get to the cover on the secondary mirror. And <clears throat> the primary mirror, well, of course, if you've got a telescope that's more than six feet in diameter, you just walk down that tube. Uh, be careful not to fall through the holes. <laughs> and uh, unco take the... Uh, uh, sector covers off the primary. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Jerry went through all the 
um, uh, procedures and showed me how to uh, <clears throat> set the telescope and uh, uh, everything. Then I had a couple of nights, uh, half nights, be that <clears throat> on with Dr. Hurd, uh, who showed me all the details of acquiring the stars and getting on the slit of the spectrograph. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, uh, at that time there was no uh, uh, television guiding. You just uh, <clears throat> climbed up the ladder and uh, if, if you were at a low declination, stood on the ladder and uh, looked through the eyepiece and got the star on the slit, uh, got the star first centered on the crosshairs and then uh, through the uh, uh, slit eyepiece got it uh, properly centered. And of course, uh, you had to keep it on the slit uh, uh, for the half hour, hour long exposure. So it meant climbing back up the ladder every uh, few minutes just to check that everything was uh, uh, guiding properly. I should say, uh, just personally, I, uh, there's something about uh, before those, all those wonderful television enhancements of the, the image to actually uh, <clears throat> uh, record with your own eye photons that have come all the way from a distant star or galaxy. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other part of the summer job was to measure the spectrographic plates that one ob obtained uh, <clears throat> at night. Uh, and that you did with a uh, <clears throat> microscope and a very accurate micrometer uh, that you'd set. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, measure those uh, absorption lines in the center uh, of the spectrum and uh, get their positions relative to the known iron comparison lines on either side and determine the radial velocity of the star uh, <coughs> in the spectrum. Uh, uh, just a couple of comments about the people at the observatory at that time. Dr. Hurd uh, who'd uh, <clears throat> been appointed as director to succeed uh, Frank Hogg. Um, <clears throat> one of his immediate influences on me, I had, <clears throat> uh, had never anticipated that I could ever earn a living as an astronomer, so I, at the university, I'd uh, uh, enrolled in the engineering and physics course. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I guess I uh, heard the saw there was some promise, and so he, he encouraged me to uh, switch into the pure mathematics and physics, which had a, an astronomy option in the, in the fourth year. Well, after about a, a, year, a month or so in Inch Phys, I did make the change. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I should point out that there's, uh, it, the Inch Phys course was an extremely good course, too, because uh, <clears throat> one of my uh, co-students in that uh, course was Alan Carswell, and he did all right with that <laughs> going in that direction. Uh, the other uh, person who I uh, learned much from, uh, Ruth Northcott, uh, <clears throat> uh, she just uh, <clears throat> sort of looked after me, to, uh, showed me all, all the good things that a careful observer would do. Um, and I was pleased that uh, she, um, <clears throat> the, my uh, high school drafting skills met her high standards and was able to uh, <clears throat> uh, even do some drawings for the observer's handbook. Uh, <clears throat> uh, another project that first summer of 1952, um, the you, if you go up to the observatory now, you'll find a, a wonderful uh, <clears throat> forest of trees surrounding the dome. When I started there, it was a bare hillside. Dr. Hurd recognized the thermal advantages of having a, a forest around the dome, and so he, he'd ordered in a, a truckload of little evergreen saplings and got a local farmer to cut furrows around the dome. And so everyone, director, secretary, summer students, for a couple of days planted little seedlings. And uh, if you go to the observatory on Monday, you'll see what's happened. Um, now, I guess for me, uh, working at the observatory was such fun, I inquired, well, 
Is it could you use anybody over the Christmas holidays? Well, yes, um, the nights are longer, uh, but okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, except there's, uh, I'd, <clears throat> uh, there's one, one catch. In the, in the winter, there could be snow up on top of the shutters, and uh, uh, it's not advised to uh, <clears throat> open the shutters and have snow that might get blowing in on top of the mirror. So what you do, uh, <clears throat> before you open the dome, you get a broom, climb up the uh, ladder on the outside of the shutters, uh, hold on with one hand and push the snow off. Straightforward, except, of course, in those days, one, there was uh, no such thing as hard hats or safety harness or, or no one else on the mountain. But it's, it's good. I, I like to climb things, so it all worked out. Um, it, <clears throat> it wasn't until my second summer that I, I met Helen, the first year she'd been on uh, sabbatical at, at Harvard. Um, and of course, uh, she was, uh, <clears throat> had uh, <clears throat> a couple of uh, 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 weeks each, each summer taking uh, photographs of globular clusters from the Newtonian focus and uh, uh, I was able to assist her down on the ground pointing the telescope and I was delighted when she uh, showed me how to um, <clears throat> guide, guide photographs from the Newtonian and actually let me take a, a, a few exposures for her. Uh, and also that uh, uh, second summer, uh, Don McRae arrived, after, he'd been originally at uh, studied at the University of Toronto and then after an extended period United States came back to Toronto um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll say something later about uh, his uh, particular uh, contributions to radio astronomy in Toronto. And here, here we are, this is the summer of uh, 1954. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they just fi finished uh, the uh, illuminizing uh, of the mirror uh, with the crew, uh, um, except Ruth and Helen are missing, so one of them must have taken the pictures, probably Ruth, who was uh, uh, often with a camera. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, point out uh, in there, there, whoops, oh no, I hit the wrong button. Let's go back. There we are. Now I'll see if I can get it. Uh, there's James Hogg. Uh, the younger son, Helen, uh, he worked uh, just like me as observer and uh, uh, plate measurer that summer. Um, and actually, Sally worked the previous summer. Sally worked not, she didn't uh, observe with the telescope, but did uh, uh, measure spectrographic plates like, like the rest of us. But I, in this picture, I want to particularly point out Jerry Longworth. Well, he's one of those people that observatories are wonderfully fortunate uh, to have a, on their staff somebody who can uh, uh, build anything, uh, repair anything, uh, and uh, beside him is, uh, whoop, I keep hitting the wrong button, try again, there, beside him uh, his uh, understudy Frank Hawker who eventually took over to uh, that same job at the uh, observatory. Uh, now, what comes next? Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Hurd uh, <clears throat> uh, gave me a particular project. Uh, uh, some of the stars in the uh, general program uh, obviously had variable velocities, must be spectroscopic binaries. He gave me <clears throat> three of them to uh, follow through on, measure, uh, measure lots of the plates, and eventually ended up in uh, publication of the orbit of three spectroscopic binaries. Uh, <clears throat> and then, um, la uh, last addition to staff while I was still around was Bev Oak, another uh, uh, one who'd originally studied at University of Toronto, and he <clears throat> uh, then had gone to uh, uh, Princeton University for, for his PhD then came back uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the faculty at Toronto. 
Uh, so what? Uh, it obviously uh, he was <clears throat> when I started wondering what where to go for uh, PhD studies. He uh, definitely explained the advantages of going to Princeton, uh, and that that I uh, then <clears throat> 1956 uh, did go to Princeton to for PH, PhD. Uh, there the Princeton Observatory was essentially a little a little appendage to the director's home. Um, <clears throat> now one of the uh, Princeton policies was that uh, uh, you finished your PhD in, in three years. Uh, this this was encouraged by the the lack of funding after the after three years. And uh, um, uh, so I, I should mention that uh, uh, Jim Hesser is another one who uh, succeeded with that uh, Princeton challenge of finishing in three years. Uh, <clears throat> In my case, uh, 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 Martin Schwarzschild asked what I was thinking about of doing for a thesis uh, in the, uh, early in my second year. And I, I said, well, uh, from my experiences at Toronto, I uh, have uh, some, some uh, uh, knowledge about globular clusters, and I have some, some knowledge about binary stars. Well, uh, Schwarzschild said, uh, here's a problem for you. Uh, <clears throat> in binary stars, uh, if you, uh, <clears throat> as they rotate, if you, if you draw the equipotentials, uh, you get something like this with uh, Roche lobes, uh, <clears throat> larger one around the more massive star, and, uh, <clears throat> Uh, lesser one under the uh, <coughs> uh, the less massive one. Uh, in fact, it's just just the same system as uh, <coughs> uh, you want the L2 there, where you want to put the uh, uh, Webb telescope in the uh, Earth-Sun system. Um, now, <coughs> uh, what happens, of course, in the, in a binary system if uh, as the star evolves and expands, it uh, eventually fills the, the Roche lobe and uh, <clears throat> over that uh, saddle point, uh, matter will flow onto the other star. The problem is that uh, all the observations showed that it's the less massive star that was filling the Roche lobe, not the most massive, which was uh, a severe uh, problem for our understanding of stellar evolution. So that was my problem, and I was able to show that uh, one, the mass uh, star in, indeed uh, starts to expand first, but once matter starts flowing over that saddle point, it's unstable, so much so that uh, by the time it stabilizes again, uh, the star that's filling its Roche lobe is, is the less massive one. So uh, <clears throat> uh, that was a very successful uh, 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 project. Um, well, <clears throat> uh, <as> I <clears throat> uh, in later years, I, uh, of course, would come home to Toronto uh, at Christmas time and uh, I definitely want to see what's going on at the observatory. Um, so I guess Christmas 1960 uh, went up, and by uh, that time, uh, Don McRae and his colleague in uh, electrical engineering, uh, <clears throat> uh, Yen, had uh, started uh, uh, major radio facilities in that all that wonderful space that's out behind the observatory. Um, all this was. Um, preliminary to uh, uh, more major facilities in uh, Algonquin Observatory. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, can claim a uh, small contribution to the beginning of uh, radio astronomy at Toronto, and my final year as a, as a summer student, um, <clears throat> it was necessary to dig a trench to get cables from the main building out to that radio shack. Uh, but of course, summer students are cheaper to hire than backhoes, and so uh, uh, we 
uh, help dig the, uh, <clears throat> the channel for the cables. Um, <clears throat> I've listed there uh, how radio astronomy um, by then was developing in Canada uh, at, at Queen's, uh, <clears throat> at, uh, uh, in Penticton, at uh, NRC in Algonquin Park, um, <clears throat> and should, should note that uh, uh, David Hogg, who uh, got into radio astronomy uh, as an undergraduate qu at Queen's, had then come to Toronto and was the first PhD in radio astronomy at Toronto. Um, so, uh, and uh, all of that uh, uh, led to the very, uh, ultimately, the very successful uh, connection between Penticton, Algonquin, and the first demonstration of uh, very long baseline interferometry. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> another uh, <coughs> uh, place where uh, <coughs> Toronto had uh, uh, an influence on my later career. <coughs> uh, by the mid-60s, I was um, <coughs> involved in, in rocket science uh, back at Princeton as part of Lyman Spitzer's uh, program for uh, putting a telescope uh, in space to uh, record ult the ultraviolet light that doesn't get through our atmosphere. Um, <coughs> uh, my initial program was just very simple one with Schmidt cameras. Uh, now aperture is only two inches in diameter, um, uh, and uh, you had only a few minutes above the atmosphere with with the rocket. Uh, this particular uh, flight, I pointed the camera at the three stars uh, in the belt of Orion, hot, uh, luminous hot stars. Um, and uh, all three, because since it was an objective spectrograph, I could get uh, three spectra at once. Uh, and indeed, uh, <coughs> uh, it was uh, successful. I got a spec, there was uh, one of the stars, Zeta Orionis, uh, in the f uh, far ultraviolet uh, <coughs> uh, lines of uh, ionized, uh, triply ionized silicon, triply ionized carbon. In fact, those absorption lines were just what I expected to see because I'd seen them in a previous rocket flight with uh, main sequence B stars. Except <coughs> because there are uh, zero order images super on a, superposed on the spectrum, it was possible to determine the absolute wavelengths of these lines. And it turned out that the uh, wavelengths of the uh, silicon and carbon lines uh, matched with those emission lines on the right-hand side of the absorption lines. What were these absorption lines? They, uh, they were not at the right wavelengths. They were, in fact, shifted about 2,000 kilometers a second uh, uh, <coughs> shortward of, of the emission lines. Uh, I needed to uh, discuss this with somebody, and I telephoned Jack Hurd in Toronto and I explained what I'd observed with my rocket. And he said, um, go have a look at the papers by Carl Beals in the publications of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. And there it was. Beals had studied uh, a series of peculiar stars, wolf Ray stars, P. Cygni stars, in which there is an absorption line on the short wavelength side indicating mass ejection from uh, these stars. The <coughs> uh, except that the, the Beale spectra got 200 kilometers a second, and I had 2,000. And, but it was the same, exactly the same phenomenon. And uh, <coughs> what, what I'd found was that uh, this high velocity mass ejection was the normal thing for hot, luminous stars. And you, by looking in the ultraviolet, you saw the absorptions from the ground state of the, uh, these ions. And so you saw the whole uh, <coughs> uh, maximum, you saw the maximum velocity uh, <coughs> profile. Now, if I have time, uh, that's uh, one uh, final reason. Uh, uh, consequence of uh, all those days in, in Toronto. Um, 
as uh, <coughs> uh, 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 one of no Lyman Spitzer, of course, was very anxious to uh, eventually put a telescope in space that could take uh, images, and for that you needed some sort of uh, recording device. And uh, a key thing in any of these space pr projects is to make sure you, before you get too involved in uh, designing and building your uh, telescope, you want to have a detector that's uh, suitable. So he uh, started a project of trying to find a suitable television tube uh, that one could uh, put into space. And that, uh, which shows then in the lower lower left, the SEC, SEC Viticon, um, which worked well in the lab. We now <coughs> the next step was to prove that one could actually do astrophysics with it. And <coughs> for that, thanks to Bev Oak, who, who now was a professor at Caltech, um, was <coughs> uh, able to get us some time on the Palomar 200 inch. So we mounted the uh, SEC Viticon in the Coudet spectrograph. That's that room at the lower left that slants down. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and we pointed the telescope at a 16th magnitude quasar, PHL 957, and exposed on it for six hours. And when we read out the uh, television tube, there it was, a wonderful spectrum. Uh, in fact, it was the uh, highest resolution one had obtained to date on a quasar uh, and had uh, um, <coughs> demonstrated that, uh, we <coughs> uh, that we did have a successful uh, a tube suitable that one could do astrophysics. Uh, and <coughs> and uh, that led to uh, uh, many more trips to Palomar on uh, uh, observing galaxies and quasars. Um, in the end, of course, um, <coughs> uh, CCDs also came along, and it uh, uh, was much preferable uh, uh, to <coughs> uh, put, a C put CCDs in the uh, Hubble telescope uh, rather than a long glass tube and the necessary high voltages. But uh, uh, <coughs> this whole process uh, had, uh, 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 I was able to uh, uh, demonstrate that I'd had uh, some big telescope experience. And so with that, when the, um, uh, the Anglo-Australian telescope was uh, advertising uh, for a director, I thought I, I might uh, uh, take a chance and apply, and so ended up with 10 wonderful years in Australia. So um, let me just finish uh, with, get, if I get this right, no, it's that one. There we are. Just to say thanks to the uh, <coughs> five people that, uh, that I <coughs> uh, sort of <coughs> encouraged my career in those years at uh, the Dunlap Observatory. Thank you. Observatory. Solar flare. Well, that one. Appropriate? Thank you. Thank you very much.